Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, Dan. I'll disappoint you. I have a little bit existentialism and hagiography in my talk, so bear with me. Um, this is an exciting time in physics. This is an exciting time in precision measurement, and one of my theory colleagues calls it the era of precision uncertainty. By that, I mean that we have loud and clear signals from the skies that the standard model of particle physics, the most successful theory that we have, the unsung hero of modern physics, is in fact incomplete because there's dark matter and dark energy, and we know precisely the composition of the universe in terms of normal matter, dark matter, and dark energy. At the same time, our terrestrial detectors do not see any confirmed signature for dark matter and dark energy, so clearly something is amiss. A nice story, the first violation of the anti-hagiography rule, um, is the discovery of dark energy by people in the um, early 90s. So they measured essentially a curve that tells you the speed of expansion of the universe as measured in terms of the redshift um, as function of distance, right? So the further away a supernova, the faster it recedes. And by putting these points in a plot, I get a plot of the expansion history of the universe. And a universe that expands at a constant rate would put all these plots on the diagonal. People in the early 90s knew that a constant rate wasn't physical because gravity would slow down the expansion and perhaps even turn it around one day. But when, and in the early 90s, all they could measure was redshifts out to 10%, and the points lie perfectly on the diagonal. But then they began to be able to measure one order of magnitude further, and it turned out the points are all lying above the diagonal, which is a sign for an accelerating universe, a completely unexpected observation. The reason I like to show that is that sometimes you make an unexpected discovery, and sometimes if you can measure a factor of 10 further, something important will happen. This is a slide I can brag about shamelessly because I haven't contributed to it at all. It is the accuracy of atomic clocks, starting with the first by Essen and Perry, the first cesium clock in 56, to the most modern strontium lattice clocks that are built in the world. And actually, the most modern is down here. It's missing on this slide. And if you draw a line from here to here, you find that the progress is, in fact, exponential. The atomic clock precision doubles every two years, similar to how the number of transistors on a chip doubles every two years or so. Um, why is this exciting? Because some people think that the solution to the riddle of dark matter and dark energy will lie in precision measurement. Maybe this mysterious type of matter that should be penetrating this room, that should be penetrating um, all our experiments, has subtle effects on the ticking, perhaps, of atomic clocks. And if the effect is down here, then you can extrapolate when the clockmakers will be able to see this effect. So this is certainly a plot that gives you hope. In my talk, I will talk about measuring the fine structure constant very precisely. Um, this was actually my postdoc project that I started in 2004. So I would like to give this talk a subtitle. It's called Finishing My Postdoc, and took quite a while. <laughs> in 2003, my boss-to-be said we can write three PRLs in the first year. The first PRL was supposed to be about multi-photon Bragg diffraction, a technology by which I can coherently kick an atom, not just with a pair of photons, but with many pairs to kick it faster. Right? The second PRL would be simultaneous atom interferometers, running two atom interferometers in a way that the sensitivity to the fine structure constant doubles, but the sensitivity to gravity is canceled. And the third PRL would be um, measuring the fine structure constant. And I thought, there's no way we can write these three PRLs in the first year. It's more going to be like one PRL in three years, which was closer to the truth, but I still wanted the job. So here's the reality. Um, 
it was a lot harder than we thought, and therefore there were a lot of more papers than we thought, which, as you know in science, is a good thing. <laughs> so I will start, um, I will spend about half an hour on this one, and then I'll go on, right? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> what's an atom interferometer? So essentially, as you know, light and matter can both behave as waves, and in order to make matter behave like waves, we need a beam splitter for matter waves, by which we use photon impulses. So essentially, I use a laser like this. The atom absorbs a photon from the laser, is transferred to a different internal state, and gets a kick. By using a pair of photons, I can make the atom absorb one photon from the first beam, and the second beam stimulates it to re-emit the photon, driving the atom back to the ground state, and transferring a net kick of two photons, okay? And that's a good thing, because now I have more velocity, and I have the atom back in the ground state, which does not decay incoherently. Using three such laser pulses, I can split up the matter waves in two paths and interfere them here, and then depending on the phase difference accumulated by the matter waves on the two paths, they come out on one output on the interferometer or on the other. These are actual photographs taken in our lab. This is, of course, a technology that is much older than the start of my postdoc. So it was started by Chu and Kasevich at Stanford, and then Riele and Luneg in Europe. Um, the phase difference of these two matter waves can be calculated essentially by the WKB method. It involves the kinetic energy and the potential energy and the phases picked up by the matter waves when they interact with the photons. Let me drive home the enormous sensitivity of atom interferometers. Where is the sensitivity from? It's from the fact that this phase difference can be millions and even billions of radians, but a one radian phase shift gives you an order unity change in the probability to detect the atoms here or here. So this is a mathematical plot to scale, of the interference fringe. This is the phase, and this is the atom number. We don't see anything, so we need to zoom in, and zoom in, and zoom in. And this is data, again, not taken by me, but by Kang Yao Chang at Stanford more than 10 years ago. So this is not even state-of-the-art data. And this illustrates the enormous sensitivity of interferometry. And maybe in the future, we can do even better. What's the fine structure constant? Well, it's this number, roughly 1 over 137, right, that determines or describes the strength of the electromagnetic interaction between elementary particles. Um, it's been measured by methods from all fields of physics, for example, by spectroscopy on muonium, but also by spectroscopy on helium, by measurements of the quantum Hall effect, so now we're talking condensed matter physics, right? By measurements of the ratio of the Planck constant to the mass of atoms and neutrons, and by measuring the electron's gyromagnetic anomaly. So the gyromagnetic anomaly is the question, how strong a magnet is the electron, right? And we learn in elementary physics classes that it's two mu bohr. And in actual fact, it's a little more than two mu bohr, and the difference of the g factor from two can be calculated by the standard model in terms of the fine structure constant. So what's going on here is Jerry Gabriels measures g minus two, and then the theorists can back out alpha from that measurement. That used to be the most precise determination of alpha at a precision of one quarter part per billion. The second most precise used to be the measurement of the ratio of the Planck constant to the rubidium atom mass as measured by the group of Biraman and now Saida Gulati in Paris. Okay, why is it 137? Well, that's obvious. Wolfgang Pauli died in room number 137 of the Rotkreuz Hospital in Zurich, and there are various other reasons why it just has to be 137. The my favorite is, is 137 is the largest prime factor of this number, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, right? <laughs> we will actually find, as a result of this measurement, 
that the fine structure constant is not 137 or 1 over 137, but it differs from 1 over 137 by more than a million sigma. Okay, so this it turns out is wrong. Okay, um, I mentioned G minus 2. This is a unique situation in physics. Here's Jerry Gabriels and his experiment measuring G minus 2. Here's our experiment standing in for any atomic physics experiment measuring the fine structure constant. You can use this number, which can be measured to part per billion precision, use the standard model to predict G minus 2, and then the G minus 2 predict measurement gives you a similar precision. So very often in physics, you have, let's say, the input number precisely measured and the output precisely measured, but the theory is not so precise, or the theory is very precise, but the input parameters are not known very well or so, right? But this is a chain of theory and experiment where everything seems to check out. Very precise input data, one of the most precise calculations ever made in science, very precise experimental check of the output. I should say that for this comparison to check out, we do not just rely on quantum electrodynamics. We need to know about muons and hadrons. We need to almost know about the tauon and the weak interaction. So if this comparison of theory and experiment checks out, large parts of the standard model have to be correct. It's a broad test of the standard model. How does atom interferometry measure the fine structure constant? Here's an equation in this guise that we all know. Um, in an undergrad course, we would learn that the energy levels of the Bohr atom are given by the Rydberg constant. And in a high energy course, you would learn that the Rydberg constant is 1 half m electron c squared times alpha squared. OK? So by solving this equality, 1 half mec squared alpha squared equals the Rydberg constant times h bar c. I can get an expression for alpha in terms of the Rydberg constant and in terms of the ratio of the Planck constant to the electron mass. Now, nobody can measure that ratio extremely precisely, but they can measure the electron mass in atomic mass units. That's been, actually, this is an outdated slide. This number has been measured to more than an order of magnitude better by the group of Klaus Blaum and Heidelberg. They have measured the mass of the cesium atom in atomic mass units, and the atom interferometer is going to measure the ratio of the Planck constant and the cesium mass, and then we have all the input data. Um, all numbers are known to very high precision, so this is a path to very high precision in the fine structure constant. How do I do that? How do I measure H over M. It's very simple. Have an atom, I fire a laser at it, the atom recoils, the recoil velocity is the photon momentum divided by the mass, so it's h bar k divided by m. If I know the wave number k, I know h over m, right? How do I measure the velocity of an atom? Well, it's also easy by the Doppler effect. So since the atom gains kinetic energy when I kick it, my photon has to be slightly blue detuned relative to the transition that the atom would have if it wasn't moving, right? So by measuring this Doppler shift, I get a measurement of H over M. The problem is that this recoil shifts the transition frequency by only two kilohertz. So I need an accuracy of about 10 decimal places to see that this effect exists at all. And to measure it to competitive accuracy, I would need a 6 to times 10 to the minus 22 measurement, and that's not possible. The problem with this scheme is it's a little bit like measuring the height of the grass on top of the Empire State Building by measuring from the f street level to the top of the grass, right? We need to eliminate the Empire State Building. We need to measure only the recoil. Sorry, this came across wrong. <laughs> um, figuratively speaking. <laughs> we need to measure only this frequency, right? So what we want to do is an atom interferometer. I compare the phase of a wave packet that remained at rest, say for gravity, to the phase of a wave packet that moved, turned around, and came back. So that phase difference 
contains a term given by the kinetic energy, right? And this kinetic energy will be proportional to the recall frequency. It's p squared over 2m, so h bar k squared over 2m, which gives rise to this recall frequency term, the famous 2 kilohertz. And by comparing this wave packet with that, we eliminate the optical transition frequency from the equation. This scheme would work, and it gives you about the first six digits of alpha. Why not more? Because gravity also causes a phase shift, and it's way larger than the one I want to measure. So to measure this one, I have to subtract gravity from an independent gravity measurement, and that precision is going to be limited. So to measure more than six digits, we need to make this better. The first way to make it better is to kick the atoms with multi-photon Bragg diffraction, the supposed first PRL that Steve Chu wanted to write, right? And the idea is that instead of having the atom absorb one photon and emit one photon, let's have it absorb five photons and emit five. That will increase the momentum to the one of 10 photons, and the kinetic energy will now be the one um, will now be 100 times the kinetic energy that I would have after one photon, right? So that increases the signal, and it, the photon number enters by its square here, so that's very efficient. Second, we need to eliminate gravity, and that's um, by running one interferometer, as I've just shown, and another one that's something like an upside-down copy of it, so that I get double the sensitivity to alpha, and I cancel the sensitivity to gravity. So now the phase difference is much simpler and only dependent on the recoil to leading order. That's good to maybe measure the first eight or nine digits of alpha, but we want 10. So one nice feature of that scheme is if I can run both interferometers at the same time, I'm going to eliminate not just gravity, but also vibrations. If I push the sensitivity of the interferometers very much, then I will be so sensitive to vibrations that it's impossible to see fringes anymore. But fortunately, I can do a parametric plot of the outputs of both interferometers. I plot one on the x-axis and the other on the y-axis, and they will plot an ellipse. The vibration controls which point on a given ellipse I will be plotting in each run of the experiment, but the phase that I want to measure determines the shape of the ellipse. And so by fitting the shape of the ellipse, I can back out the phase, the differential phase between the interferometers, that's my signal, even if the individual interferometers do not yield fringes. This is actual data shown here. Okay. And then finally, to get the 10th digit of alpha, we make this even better by inserting a coherent matter wave accelerator in the middle based on Bloch oscillations. Essentially, these are accelerated optical lattices. So I start with a standing wave, and then I detune the laser beams so that I form one optical lattice moving up and another one moving down. And if that happens adiabatically, then the atoms will be accelerated coherently. Again, this happens at the same time for the two interferometers because that kills vibrations. Okay, here's how it looks like. Um, standard atomic fountain. Um, there's a three-dimensional mod. There's a chamber where we do Raman sideband cooling um, to get down to maybe 100 or 200 nanokelvin. The experiment happens inside this magnetically shielded region. In theory, we can fly the atoms for a little bit more than one second, but it turns out that the signal is proportional to the time of flight, and the strongest systematic, the gravity gradient, goes like the time cubed. So we actually run the interferometer only for 80 milliseconds at most, because that's where we get enough signal, but not too much systematic effect. This is how it looked like in 2009, and this is how it looked like in about 2012, maybe. So it's a complicated setup. You see lots of lasers. The mod is here, a 2D mod is in the foreground, and the lasers that drive Bragg diffraction are not shown here. This is raw data. So in order to 
characterize systematic effects, we take a lot of redundant data. In theory, taking only one of these ellipses should determine alpha, but we need to check for systematic effects. For example, we need to know that the fine structure constant doesn't depend on the time of flight of the atoms. And so we run the interferometer at five milliseconds, 10, 20, 40, and so on. And you see how the ellipse contrast goes down as the time increases, but nevertheless, the sensitivity here is the highest. We blinded ourselves by sending part of the data analysis code to Rana Adhikari at Caltech, who added a random number and sent us the code back in a compiled version, so we were unable for a long time to see where in this red region our measurement would fall. And this is all we knew about our result while analyzing the systematic effects. This is the table of systematic effects. I'm not going to go over all of them. Let me just say that the big effects are not new and the new effects are not big, and that's good news. So the big effects are well-known things like the gravity gradient, the cancellation of gravity is not perfect because one interferometer flies a little higher than the other. The Goy phase, the wave number of a finite-sized Gaussian beam is not the same as the wave number of a plane wave. That's in here. And wave front curvature, that's the same. New effects come from Bragg diffraction because it has a so-called diffraction phase that we have studied um, a lot. And we're finally able to constrain using Monte Carlo simulations within these arrow bars here. I show, yeah. And as you see, the biggest systematic effects are just from the fact that this is an exaggerated version of our Gaussian beam. It's not a plane wave. The local wave vector is not the same as the wave vector of a plane wave. That's where all the big effects come from. The last, one of the last systematic effects was from a totally unexpected, um, but with hindsight obvious um, effect. The beam from a fiber is not Gaussian. It fits a Gaussian very well in the middle, but then turns more Lorentzian far away from the center. And so we get a lot of stray light at the vacuum chamber walls. And that means that our data had these erratic variations. When we cut off those tails by an apodizing filter, the variations were gone. Okay, I need to come to a close. Suffice it to say that there were lots of things besides the error budget that we checked. So for each of these influences, we have data to confirm that there is no such influence. Before I reveal the result, what could be happening if there was a deviation of alpha from the expected could be due to a so-called dark photon, a dark matter candidate. I don't have time to say much about it, except that all the particle experiments have searched for it, and they have limits. This, the dark photon mass, the dark photon coupling constant, and this is all ruled out. Okay, and then you unblind, and this is the result. So we are here. Jerry Gabriel's measuring G minus two is here. The LKB group measuring H over M rubidium is here. Within the error bars, we completely agree with LKB, and there's a 2.5 sigma deviation from Gabriel's. Is this worrying me? To zero order, it's not worrying me. This is, I think, a great confirmation of the standard model. Hey, this is agreement on the 10th decimal place. We thought the standard model might have broken down much before that, right? Here's the result, 1 over 137.035999046. Um, 1.3 million sigma away from 1 over 137. Put it in context, so we are slightly better than G minus two, but it's really the same, right? Um, the accuracy is better than the size of the fifth order QED in the G minus two calculation, much better than the size of the hydronic contributions. And somebody online, a particle physicist, put it in the context of the G muon minus two, which is known to deviate from the standard model prediction. If you draw these combined confidence regions, then you find the standard model is actually ruled out at slightly more than four sigma, if you trust both measurements, right? And there have already been theory papers on the archive where 
people propose a new particle that can explain both deviations simultaneously. Here is the dark photon limit from our measurement. It's actually better than all the particle collaborations, except that the particle collaborations have now published new data, which is about two times better than us. For a short time, however, or there is now this neck-to-neck -neck race between tabletop physics and particle physics. Anyway, here's my group in a recent um, picture. Future upgrades, we want a thicker beam to make the beam more like a plane wave. And in the end, I want to thank the people involved in this. I should thank Xiao Yu. He was the first postdoc who set up the experiment starting in 2009 and Pei Chen, the first grad student, and they had interference fringes not even one year after the optical tables were brought into the lab. And I should thank the people who finished it. These are Richard Parker, the postdoc who is here, Cheng Wei Yu and Wei Cheng, the grad students, and Joyce, undergrad student, and here's the fine structure constant cake. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.